Oh, can we give that unto the Lord right now? Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. You may be seated for just a moment. What an honor it is to be here at JNCC. There's no place I would rather be. I love my home church, and I love you wonderful people. And to all of you uh, who told me you weren't going to be able to make it today, but you said you'd be watching Facebook Live, maybe you're headed to va on vacation, you may be headed to the beach, you may be headed uh, to the mountains, but I want to tell you I love you, and I miss you as well today. To all of our guests today, thank you. You could have been anywhere. J and CC, can we give them a hand clap today? We're so honored to have all of our guests with us today. And if you do not have a home church, uh, we would love to have you here uh, at Jesus Name Community Church. Today is Father's Day, and it is a very special day. Uh, the Lord blessed us uh, when He gave us fathers. I'm going to read something. That I, I read it a couple years ago, and I'm going to read it again. That four years old, the mindset and watch the progress as it takes place and it unfolds. A four-year-old says, my daddy could do anything. An eight-year-old says, my dad doesn't know. A 12-year-old says, naturally, dad does not understand. 14 years old, my dad was hopeful, hopelessly old-fashioned. At 21 years old, I said, that man is out of date. What would you expect? 25 years old, he comes up with a good idea every now and then. 30 years old, we must find out what dad thinks about it. 35 years old, a little patience. Let's get dad's input first. 50 years old, what would dad have thought about it? And at 60 years old, I sure do wish I could talk it over with dad one more time. And I think I hit about everybody in this place. Because there's some of us here sitting beside our father. There's some of us here that maybe not, may not be with our dad right now, but we know where he is. And there's some of us here today that wish that dad was still sitting beside us. To all of you, wherever you are and whatever you're doing, whether you have a father uh, with you today, if you don't have a father, to all of us, can I tell you there's a heavenly father in this place today coming to minister to the needs of every person in this place today. I give honor to my father, my dad, Pastor Porterfield. I give honor to my grandfather, uh, Brother Billy Clyde Wilbanks, most know him as Paul Bill, and uh, I'm going to talk about Dad in just a second, but I, I do want to say, Paul Bill, I, I rarely give you the credit that I deserve, or you deserve that I deserve, that you deserve, I deserve it as well maybe one day, but I rarely give you the credit that you deserve. Paul Bill has rarely stepped behind a, a pulpit. He has rarely held a mic in his hand and preached but this man has been faithful he has been steady he has been a pillar and an example uh, to my family and to this church and what a wonderful man that he is and let me tell you I, I seen a scripture today that I thought it fit you Paul Bill because where he may have never preached a message he is a preacher's friend and where he has maybe never taught a class sang a solo he loves the ministry and Paul Bill, by Paul Bill I read this scripture Matthew chapter 10 verse 41 it says this he that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward and he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward and whosoever shall give drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water only in the name of a disciple verily I say unto you he shall in no wise 
lose his reward. Paul Bill, can I tell you today, you're going to get the same reward I get. You're going to get the same reward that any man, any preacher that's ever come up to this pulpit. You're getting that reward because of your steadfastness, because of your integrity, because you received the ministry. And I feel like that's a word for every man in here that may say, well, I'm not a preacher. Well, I'm not a pastor. Well, you've been faithful, and you've been, you've been a contributor, and you've been committed and dedicated. Can I tell you, you're going to get the same reward that I get. You're going to get the same reward that Brother Chad Bateman gets. You're going to get the same reward. Can we stand to our feet today and clap our hands for every father in this place that may not get the credit that he deserves, but he shows up every Sunday. He shows up every Wednesday. He's at every altar call when he feels like it and when he don't feel like it. Let me tell you, there's a reward waiting on you. There's a, there's a prize at the end of the day. You can remain standing. I wanted to say that. Not just to Paul Bill, that was for Paul Bill, but for everybody that's in this place. Before I preach today, I, wanna, I want to present you a testimony today. Sister Lormy, will you come up to the front? She told me, she said, you ain't going to make me say anything, are you? Sister Sanford sent us a Facebook message and a text message. She was in Texas. Brother Adrian Sanford was uh, ministering uh, in Texas at the camp. She said, can you, I was in Corinth, and she said, I know you're busy, but can you get to the church? Sister Lormy is, is, is serious. She said, Lormy's ready for a change. Come on up here, Sister Lormy. And she walked up, me and Amelia, we came up, she walked in the side door here, and I knew when I, knew when I seen her. This time is different. I don't know how many times we prayed. You know, it's been a, it's been a lot of times, ain't it? We prayed. Uh, many of you have prayed for her. Sister Sanford has prayed for her. Her father's not here today. I promise you he's probably preaching and ministering the gospel. But I promise you he is a proud, a godly proud father today. She was filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. She sat right here on this altar. And I watched as she prayed for hours. I, I'm talking about she prayed. She wouldn't quit. And she stood. I said, Lord, me lift your hands. And tears started flowing down her face. And the Holy Ghost started flowing out of her. Let me tell you, God can feel you. God can touch you. Father, don't, for, don't give up on your children. Don't you give up. Mother, don't you give up on your child. I don't care if they're 25. I don't care if they're 30. I don't care if they're 50. Don't you quit praying. Don't you quit showing up to church. Lormy is an example and a testimony. God's got great things for you, Sister Lormy. I want us to, can we pray? Thank you, Sister Lormy. Can we praise the Lord right now for what he has done? Can we give him a, a great shout of praise? There's revival coming to this place. There's revival coming to this city. And Sister Lormy, if she wants to give you her testimony, she can. That's hers to give. But the Lord has brought her a mighty way. I'm going to tell you right now, she's going to impact this world. She's going she's gonna to change a lot of young people's life. I believe that in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you so much, Sister Lormy, for obeying the Holy Ghost. All right, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the, to the book of First Peter, chapter 2. Verses 4. I'm going to read down through there. The Bible says, To who coming, as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Yea, also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up a spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God by Jesus Christ for the sake of time. Skip to verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. I want to preach to you today on this subject. We need priests. We need priests. 
Would you lift your hands in this building right now and let the Holy Ghost move throughout this place? God, I love you. Lord, I worship you. God, I ask you to minister in this house. God, I ask you to use me, God. Lord, let my lips be as a pen of a ready writer, God. Lord, I'm asking you if there's anybody in this place that's never experienced you in the power of the Holy Ghost, God, I ask you to fill them today from the top of their head to the soles of their feet. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Somebody shout amen. Clap your hands as you're being seated today. We need priests. I read an article a few years ago about the Catholic Church, and it went something like this. We are witnessing the greatest crisis of the priesthood in the history of the church. Whole areas in Europe are now without priests, and all is hushed up. You do not even hear a single bishop Raise the alarm, weeping with the faithful, asking everyone to pray intensely for priestly vocations and ordering fasting with ardent supplications that the Lord may have mercy upon his people. It said in France, there are towns, whole towns, with thousands of people and no priests. Some priests, they said, have to oversee dozens of parishes or churches because there is nobody, nobody to fill the gap and take on the responsibility of the priest. To our priestless apostolic homes throughout this world. Statistics say this, nearly 10 million youth ages 12 to 20 in this country report that they have consumed alcohol in the past 30 days. On an average, young people lose their virginity at the age of 17. 63% of youth suicides are from fatherless homes. 90% of homeless and runaway children are from fatherless homes. 80% of rapists come from fatherless homes. Homes. Don't do not look at me today and tell me that the role of the father is not important. Do not look at me today and mention to me that they'll be fine without me. Because that is a lie from the devil. Let me tell you what we need in this day and hour is for men to stand up and say, I will, I will fill the gap and I will be the priest of my home. When we think of a priest, and some of us, when we think preacher, we think of a man in a robe and a hat maybe. Some of us think of a suit with a white collar. Others think of their very own pastor. We have certain standards of who and what a priest is. Bear with me today as I build a foundation. But the Bible says ye are a chosen generation and a royal priesthood. Can I tell you today that God did not only call the man that holds the mic. Nor did he call the man that reads the scripture text to us every Sunday and every Wednesday. But he called every man under the sound of my voice that comes home tired after a hard day at the factory. Can I tell you today that he called every doctor that brings home the burdens of the wounds of dying people home with him in the back of his mind. He called every farmer today whose hands and neck are the same color as this Mississippi clay. He called every mechanic whose grease stains speak loud that they labored hard in the machine shop. He called you to be more than just a father that comes and places food on the table. He called you to be the priest of your home. He called you to be the father that you are called to be. A father that is holy. A father that is righteous. A father that is genuine. A father that is pure. God called us to lead our families. Every man under the sound of my voice. Every individual 
that is listening to me maybe via the internet he called you for such a time as this book of Psalms chapter 78 says give ear O my people to my law incline your ears to the words of my mouth I will open my mouth in a parable I will utter dark sayings of old which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us we will not hide them from their children showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done listen to this he says for he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children Verse 5 lets us know that the most effective way to impact the next generation is by the fathers and the parents in this building. That's the most effective way. We can set back and try the school system. We can set back and we can try therapists. We can set back and we can send them this, send them to grandmother, send them to grandfather. But the most effective way is for me, myself, to step up to the plate and say, honey, we're going there. We're going to get down to the church. We're going to read the Bible. We're going to get a hold of God. I can tell you today a little bit of what it's like being a father, but I can only tell you to some extent or to some degree because my parenting experience only goes to the age of 13. My oldest son is 13 or my oldest child is 13. So I can give you uh, some of the experience that I've learned up until this point. But I cannot take you past that. And past that, my resource is a man sitting over here to my left. And that man is Gary Porterfield. And so all I can tell you past the age of 13 uh, of, of parenting a child that age, past that, all I can tell you is what I've learned, Brother Steve Kirkman, from, from Brother Gary Porterfield. And there's a few things that I've learned from this man. And if I have uh, an opportunity to preach another 50 father day, Father's Days, if I have the opportunity to preach another 40 Father's Days, I am going to take the opportunity and tell what this man has taught me. The first thing that this man taught me was to protect. As a father, we must always protect our family. Can I tell you, there was never a day that I left my house where I felt unsafe as long as dad was there. As long as my dad was in reach for a long time, for, for many years, I didn't think there was a man that could take my daddy. And then I got older and I, I realized that, that maybe I was confused a little bit and I could probably take him today. But, uh, and he really wants to jump out of that chair right now and come to the pulpit and try me. But, but for the longest, there was never a day uh, that I thought that anybody could take my dad. My dad was the strongest, I thought. My dad was, 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 was uh, he could overpower anybody. There was no situation that, that my dad could not uh, handle uh, it wasn't long ago that uh, I picked up Brantley from school when he was younger, and uh, I was just talking to him, and, and I, I wanted Brantley to view me the same way that I viewed my father. And so I said, Brant, I'll put these scenarios in his head. I said, Brant, uh, if, if America was invaded and, and, and you had one phone call, terrorists had taken over the land, who would you who'd you want to call? And I was waiting on, well, you, Dad. He said, I'd probably call Papa. <laughs> I thought you, you wouldn't call me. You, you, I, let, let me let me rephrase this thing, you know. That my dad always made me feel safe. Always. I, I don't know what it was. Uh, I don't know if, if he, uh, if that was just the way he carried himself, but I would say that many of you 
in this place that if you had a father worth his salt, if you had a father that was, that was worth some of value to you, you felt safe when daddy was around. As a father, we must always protect. When I was in the woods, I didn't want to be with none of you. I wanted to be with my daddy. When I was in a dark alley, I didn't want to be with nobody else. I wanted to be with my daddy because I knew that that man was going to go to whatever length it was to make sure that I was safe. He would give his own life if it took. That same instinct, I didn't know that if I, one of the, the scariest things uh, for me as a father is I, I, I did not want to fail my children because I had been blessed with the best. And uh, I wanted to make sure that, that I had that. And I had Brantley at a very young age. And I remember as a young dad, a young father, I remember uh, I wanted, uh, and that day I liked golf a lot more than I do now. And uh, I guess I realized that I was wasting my time and I was wasting my money because I wasn't going to get any good. It, that was as good as I was going to get. But I loved golf back then, and Brantley was a natural little athlete, and I, I wanted to take him everywhere I went. And so I remember one day in particular that I wanted to go play golf and I wanted Brantley to come with me. But Paul Paul had done opened his mouth and said he was going to take the horses down to the church and we were going to ride the horses. And uh, at that point in time, uh, Brantley didn't want to have anything to do with golf. He wanted to just ride the horses and I'm the one that wanted to play golf. And now things have changed. I don't want to play golf no more. He wants to play because uh, I don't have no money to play golf and he, he, he don't care about money because it ain't coming out out of his pocket and I want to go I want to go ride the horse because it's free but this particular day he didn't want to play golf he wanted to ride horses and I'll never forget he's about four years old four or five he's about Remy's age and uh, he he got on candy man you remember this day daddy and I don't know the candy man was a younger horse and we got him from uh, Nathan Vanderford and Sharon and Nathan probably prayed a prayer over him I don't know what what got into that horse but something got into that horse that day and with Brantley on the back of him by himself is one of the first times he ever rode the horse by himself I mean that horse in that arena took off wide open I mean shoo! I mean he was he was running and an instinct come out of me I mean I was just a young father, but, but something come out of me. And if it was y'all's kids on there, I probably wouldn't have stepped in front of a running horse. But, but with my kid on the back, I didn't think twice. And I stopped. And without, without hesitation, I stepped. And when that horse was going on, I put my hand, timed it perfect, picked Brantley up off the saddle, and he kept running. And he was dangling from my hand. I'll never forget. He got, he got in my arms, and he, he looked at me. He said, Daddy, you saved my life. You saved my life. And then he said, as we was riding home, he said, we should have went golfing today. <laughs> but we must protect our family. There must be a, an instinct in us that nothing's going to touch my baby. Nothing's going to touch my family. There must be an instinct in us to where we rise up to the occasion. And when the devil comes in, when the adversary comes in, when the enemy comes in, we rise up and say, wow, whoa, God has placed me over this family. I'll never forget Remy in the hospital. She was just a little baby just a little baby and she was so so sick she was probably four months old and we were we were young parents me and Amelia and and we we uh, w took her to the emergency room it was about three o'clock and apparently everybody in the tip of Alcorn County area was sick that night I mean there were people standing outside I don't know what the occasion was but I just know that everybody was there my little baby couldn't breathe she couldn't breathe. She was throwing up. She was lifeless. Amelia was holding her, and I was trying to keep my, my cool together, and I walked up, and I told him, I said, we need to check her in. He said, we've got a lot of people in front of you. We're going we're, we're, we're gonna, to we're gonna see what we can do. And I said, that's fine. I understood that. I would try to be very understanding. And I was, I sat back down there, and, and I, she just began to, uh, uh, without being too uh, vulgar or, or maybe exposed too much and, and too nasty, but she was, she was vomiting. 
uh, everything that she had. And it got to the point we'd been there for a couple hours, and she was just dry heaving. There was nothing left left to throw throw up and, and left in her body. And she was just lifeless sitting there. I was scared to death. And I walked up there, and I said, I said, how soon? How soon? He said, you got to wait on the list. And I mean, I was getting, there was, there was hair standing up on the back of my head because I thought I was fixing to lose my baby girl. And I, I said, how much longer are you going to take? I, Amelia kept telling me, Corey, calm down. You sit down. Finally, I went back up there, and I probably got on their nerves a little bit, but I was not coming to ask them to get her, them in before anybody else. I was coming to ask for Pedialyte because I was afraid she was dehydrating because she had nothing left in her body. And as when I come up this time, I done been up several times, so, you know, I understand where they were coming from. But he looked at me and he said, your baby will have to wait. And that instinct hit me again. And I said, no, she won't. I said, I'll walk back there right now and get the Pedialyte if I need to. And, and he looked at me and he said, he said, you need to calm down, sir. And one lady over to the left, she said, she was an older lady. She'd probably enter, I wouldn't say older, middle age. I don't want to offend nobody here today. But I ain't going to say what age she is now. But she, she had a, 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 a sprained arm or something. I don't know what happened to her. But she said, we've been here all night. I said, you're 40. I just told the age. I did that on purpose. And my wife said, you need to calm down. And when they realized we needed Pedialyte, because I was fixing to just leave to go to Walmart, get a Pedialyte, they stood back, the guy stood back up, and he said, he said, I understand. He said, I got kids too. He said, you let me get back in here, and, you, and we're going to get you some Pedialyte. Let me tell you, you, at some point, we need to get like that spiritually, and we need to look at the devil and say, hey, devil, I, I don't care what you've been trying to do. I don't care what your plan is. God's got another plan, and you ought to get mad. And say I'm here to protect I'm here to protect I'm here to make sure that my baby is taken care of as fathers we must be protectors the Bible says this in Psalms 127 low children are in heritage of the Lord and the fruit of the womb is his reward as fathers it's our calling to protect what God has blessed us with but not just from terrorists or not just from a bad situation. But let, can I tell you that my dad protected us from many things. He pr protected us from many, t many things. He protected us from worry. I never worried as a kid. I didn't know if things were falling under. He didn't, he didn't put those things on me. He, he protected us from bitterness when something was thrown on him. Brother Tommy Wilbanks, he didn't come out and say, can I tell you what so-and-so in the church did to me? He protected us from bitterness because he didn't want to raise up a child, a generation that was going to walk around with bitterness or a chip on their shoulder. He protected us from hurt. That was not one time. That was not one time, and I can say that without hesitation, that we sat at a table as a family and had any family in this church for dinner. We didn't do it. We didn't do it. If we opened our mouth about another family church or about another church down the road, my dad would say, well, you ain't going to do that in my house, boy. You ain't going to do that in my house. He protected us from negativity. He wouldn't let us be negative because he understood that we were a blessed people, that we were a blessed family. And he said, I'm not going to raise up a generation that's got its negative all the time. He said, I'm going to raise up a generation that understands the blessings of God. I'm going to raise up a generation that understands that God has been good. We have got to be protectors today. We've got to be protectors. You want to know why I love the church with all my heart? You want to know why? Was it because the church was perfect? No. No, I know the church isn't perfect. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. Nobody in, but I'll tell you why. I grew up loving the church because my dad protected me from all the situations going on to the church. Let me tell you, husbands, fathers, let me tell you, you protect your family. You protect your family. I don't care what's going on on the stage. I don't care what's going on in here. There may be some stuff. Let's get it worked out, but don't let the kids know about it because they need the, they're going to need the church one day. They're going to need the people of the church one day. I wish somebody would stand to their feet right now and clap your hands into the Lord and say I'm here to protect the next generation we must be protectors oh hallelujah you may be seated my dad never came home complaining can I tell you sometimes protect protection is in your silence 
I'm going to say that one more time. Sometimes protection is in your silence. A father... A father's worth in many ways is never truly appreciated until he's gone. Many times we never realize that he's blocking the wind because we never knew it was there in the first place. Sometimes you don't realize how awesome your daddy was, how amazing your father was until he's gone and there's no wall blocking the wind. There's nobody taking the pressure. There's nobody dealing with the stress. And now all of a sudden, all of that is poured upon you. And you sometimes you never appreciate him until he's gone. And there's some people out here right now that's lost their father in the last few years. And you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know exactly what I'm preaching about right now. When Elijah was called up and Elisha had to wrap himself in Elijah's mantle, before Elijah was gone, all Elisha had to worry about was pouring water on the prophet's hands. But when he was gone, all the responsibility fell on him. Some of us here today never realized how strong our father was, how important he was to the family, what he brought to the table until he left or until you had your own family. And here you are with your own household. And you're wondering, how in the world did my father do it? How in the world did my daddy keep it together? How in the world did that man, did that man hold the pieces together? We've got to protect. I'm hurrying, I promise. Not only do we have to protect, my dad was always a provider. A true priest of the home will always provide for his family. We got some of the hardest working men sitting in this, in this church today. Some of the hardest working men. There's men in this place that, that work themselves. So they, they get up before dark and come home after dark. There's some men in this place that will literally go to whatever lengths that it takes to provide for their family. I'm looking at, the, at people in this room right now that I, if, I don't want to start calling names, but there are some hard working men in this place. Can we give them a hand clap today? My dad was willing to do whatever it took to provide for our family. Me and we were made in the image and the likeness of God. And one of his names in the Old Testament was Jehovah Jireh, my provider. God called us to provide. The first seven years of my life, my dad worked at Benchcraft while pastoring our church. And then he worked with Paul Bill for, for another, another five, four or five years in the alternator shop. I don't know if you guys remember the alternator shop, but our church began to grow until he went full time as, resp as, as responsibility grew larger. Uh, he would shoe horses on the side. He cut pulp wood on the side. And my, nev my dad never shied away from hard work. He was a provider. It was in his DNA. Let me tell you, we got a pastor that's a worker. He is a worker. And that man never shied away from work. He did not pastor a church so he didn't have to work. Because I know how some people think. And let me tell you this about pastoring. Ministry, sometimes I miss clocking in. I ain't going to lie to you. I miss clocking in and being able to clock out when I'm walking in carnality. Because <laughs> I ain't no way if I don't have the Holy Ghost, I don't know how people do it without the Holy Ghost. But this man never, never, there was never a day that we, he didn't provide food and money. He didn't just provide, though, money and food. He provided wisdom. I can't tell you how many times my dad stopped me from making dumb decisions. He provided counsel. He provided friendship. There's more to being dad, dad than just, just clocking in. We've got to provide wisdom for them. We've got to provide an example of faithfulness and commitment. A father, in order to impact the next generation, we've got to provide quality time, and I'm hurrying. But we have got to spend time with our families. My dad always made time for our family. Charles Francis Adams, son of the U.S. President John Quincy Adams, was a diplomat to, diplomat to, the great, to great Britain as had been his father and grandfather before him. On one occasion, he wrote this in his diary. Went fishing with my son today. 
a day wasted. His son Brooks wrote this same, the entry, this entry, the same day, went fishing with my father, the most wonderful day of my life. Every chance we get, we ought to spend time with our family, and I'm preaching to myself right now. When I begin to put this down on paper, when I begin to put, every chance we get, we ought to spend time with our family. Amelia had to go. We've had two long weeks of youth camp. Amelia had to go last Saturday to the furniture market. Charlie brought over rabbits, and I'm, I'm going to talk with Charlie after uh, church today. But he brought over rabbits. I was mad. I'm just kidding. I wasn't too mad, but a little bit. And my daughters were in heaven. They were in heaven. I mean, they were jumping. They were excited. They wanted, and we still got them blooming rabbits because I didn't, I can't, I can't say any other adjective on, 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 on behind the pulpit. But we still got those crazy rabbits, and they, they can't wait to go out on the back porch and feed those rabbits. You'll watch Lexi. She'll be out there. You're wondering where she'll turn them loose. She'll have the cage open. But that day when he brought those rabbits over, Amelia was gone. It was just me, Lexi, and Remy that day. Brantley was gone. And I had a day. I spent a ton of time with Brantley. And sometimes I don't get to spend as much time with my daughters. And so I just had them. And so I told them, today we're going to go eat. And we're going we're gonna to go to Tractor Supply. And we're going to buy a cage. And we're going we're gonna to feed them, get rabbit food. And we're going to do all this stuff. And it was the best day. We, we got all this. We was walking through Tractor Supply. I had my cage. And I was walking through there. And I had two little happy girls. They were proud. They was telling everybody we was getting rabbits. And we got home. And we put the rabbit cage together. And they were talking. And Red Lexi was telling me that the rabbits were biting her. And, I mean, everything. And we had just the most wonderful day. And while we were there, nobody was around. I began to tell them, Sister Sanford. I began to look at Remy. I began to look at, look at Lexi. And I, I, I began to tell Brantley. My dad used to do it to me. He would prophesy to me. I don't know if he, he, I know he remembers. He probably don't even think that I would, I remember. But he used to prophesy to me when we'd be by ourselves. Corey, you're going to be blessed one day. Corey, you're going to do this. You're going to be a preacher of the word one day. He would prophesy. And when I was a teenager, I, I, I didn't want anything to do. But the prophecy came forth. And I understood. I realized that there may be something to that stuff. So I'll just be, every, every once in a while, I'll get Brantley. We'll be going down the road. And I'll start prophesying. He don't know I'm prophesying. But I'm just, he thinks I'm just talking to him. But I looked at Lexi and Remy that day. And I started telling him, you're going to be a blessed woman of God. You're going to be, the, you're going to be a prayer warrior. You're going to be an awesome singer. I'm telling you right now. Somebody ought to get it in their heart that I'm going to, if I'll spend time with these kids and speak things into their life, things will happen for them. Things will turn around for them. I wish somebody would stand to their feet right now. I wish you'd lift your hands and say, God, help me. Help me, God, to be the father, to be the parent that I need. Oh, just pray for just a moment. I wish you'd lift your hands. I'm coming to a close. I've preached too long already. I wish you'd just lift your hands right now and begin to pray. In the name of Jesus, God, I ask you to touch every man. I ask you to touch every person in this place. God, minister to the knees. I wish somebody would open their mouth right now and begin to pray in the Holy Ghost right now. Oh, hallelujah. God, I need you. God, I need you, God, to help me to be the man that I need to be. Lord, clap your hands right now. You can remain, remain standing, Brother Jeremy. You can come. I'm going to hit these last few points very quickly, and then I'm going to, we're going to have an altar call. We're going to pray for the preachers today. Mom already men, mentioned it. We, a priest prays. A priest knows how to pray. A father that is successful in leading a Christian home always they may be of different stature they may have different jobs they have may have different callings but one thing that they will always do is they always pray and that man right there always prays always prays sometimes i think oh god i don't know if i can feel them shoes 
I was telling Brother Ashcroft, uh, he was up at our house yesterday, and we was talking about uh, pastoring in the church, and that's what I told him. He'll tell you. I told him, I said, I don't know. I said, I, I, me and my dad are completely different. I preach different than him. I see them. Me and my dad, we can have be a situation, and it's the same situation, but we see two different things. He sees a barn that's full of treasure, and I see a barn that's full of junk. I mean, it, it don't matter. We can be building a fence, and I think it ought to be done this way, and he thinks it ought to be done that way. But let me tell I can tell you one thing about this man. He taught me how to pray every morning, every morning. He prayed. You listen to me, fathers. If we are going to do the job that we need to do, it's going to be because we pray. It's going to be because we pray. And it's going to be because our kids seen us pray. I feel the Holy Ghost in this place. I want you to hear me right now. The Bible says that the man is the priest over his home, or it teaches that, the principle that he's the priest over his home. That's why God referred to himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He didn't become Isaac's God while Isaac was a child. He became Isaac's God when Isaac became a man. He became Jacob's God when Jacob became a man. It's a process where God began to deal with the father and the blessings were passed to the child from the father. The father named the child. He spoke into his life. He was the priest over his home. That's why when Noah survived the flood, it wasn't a house he built first. It was an altar he built first. This is where it matters to the kingdom because there must be a transfer from the father to the child. Dad, don't you come here. He represents Abra Abraham. Brantley, don't you come here. Brantley represents Jacob. Because there must be a transfer. Because if there's going to be an apostolic church in 30 years in Walnut, Mississippi, it's because somebody poured into the next generation. It's because some homes had a priest. A father that prayed, a father that was faithful, a father that was committed, a father that was dedicated. So what has to happen is, is Abraham poured into Isaac, and because Abraham poured into Isaac, Isaac's generation had a leader. And Isaac didn't stop there. Isaac poured into Jacob. And because Jacob was poured into, Jacob's generation had a leader. So you hear me right now. Those little boys that you're raising up, those little girls that you're raising up, you hear me, they're not just going to live for God on their own. They're not just going to live for God because you told them that's what so-and-so did. No, 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 no. God, can't, it can't be the God of your grandmother. He can't be the God of your grandfather. He's got to be your God. And when he comes in and you pour something's poured into you and he's your God, then you got to turn to the next generation and you got to pour into that generation. I feel the Holy Ghost in this place. And when you, this generation, when my, I'm talking to my generation too, when we get it, we can't hold it. We've got to turn around and we've got to pour into the next generation. So, so in 20 years, there's still somebody in this church, there's still somebody in this town lifting up the name of Jesus Christ. Christ, worship in the name of Jesus Christ, preach in the name of Jesus Christ. We got to be about our father's business. That's what Jesus said. He said, I was about my father's business. I feel the Holy Ghost so strong in here. I'm going to read one story. Brother Kenny Chester told me this right before church. I said, if you can find that, send that to me. I want to read the article like it says that some years ago a greeting card company started a special Mother's Day program for fe federal prison inmates. Prisoners received a free card 
a postage paid to send to their mothers for Mother's Day. The response was overwhelming. The lines were so long. Representatives had to return, uh, to return to the factory to get more cards. The program was so su successful, the company decided to come back on Father's Day. They were sending mother, Mother's Day cards out. I mean, uh, as many as they could get, they were sending them out. But when Father's Day come around, not one prisoner in there, not one, this is true, sent a Father's Day card. Not one. There were no lines at all, it says. Not a single inmate wanted to send a card to his father. Truly a loving relationship with a father has a profound effect on one's life. And the lack of an engaged, active father is a strong determining factor in the behavior of an individual. Let me tell you something. We need priests in our homes. We need priests in our houses. We need men leading the house. Every man, I'm so thankful that you're here today because we need men that'll look at the family when they're tired and don't want to go to church. They say, boy, you get up. Baby, you get up. We're getting those kids to the house of God. I'm tired too, but you get up. We're getting those kids to the house of God. And I'm so thankful for the men of this church because almost every time this altar, this left side of this altar, every man, and I'm telling you, it is full. And you ought, to, you ought to be the first one to teach your child that every chance you get, we're going to the altar. We're going to the altar. Amelia, I want you to grab Lexi and Remy. I want you to bring them up on this altar. Every man in this place, if you would, I want you to lead your family up to this altar if you can. I want you to grab a hold and say, follow me up here. I want you to get up here, and I want you to stand. Ladies, I want you to stand with your men. We're going to pray. We're going to pray. Oh, hallelujah. Sister Lormie, Sister Sanford, I want you to come up here because what a, what a testimony of hope. What a testimony of hope. Come on. I want you to get as close as you can. I want you to get as close as you can. I want you to tell, I want you to tell and show an example example to your family. Oh, that we got to have God. Oh, we need priests in this place. We need priests in this house. Oh, come on in. Filter on in. There's people coming down the aisles. Oh, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Oh, I praise you. Come here, Mill. I want you up on the stage. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. One of the greatest honors that I have Remy's asleep right now, done bored her to death. One of the greatest honors that I have is to lead, to lead this crew right here. Is to lead them. And I, take, I don't take that lightly. It's important to me. It's important to me that my family knows how important the house of God is. It's important to me. And I hope it's important to you. So I wish you would just put your hand on the back of your wife. Kids, I want you to get close, close to your family. If you don't have family here today, you're more than welcome to come up here because we're all the body of Christ. We're all family. You're more than welcome to come up here on this stage with me. But I wish we would right now begin to pray over our families, father and five mothers, five wives. I wish you would pray for that husband because you do not know the pressure that he's carrying. You do not know what he's blocking off of you. You do not know what he's protecting you from. You don't know what he's having to deal with on a daily basis. You don't know what he's carrying you'll know when he leaves you'll know when he dies you'll know when he passes on but right now you don't even realize how strong that man is how powerful that man is i wish you'd pray a prayer over him right now in the name of jesus go ahead go ahead pray church pray church i wish you'd pray praise team if your family's down there you ain't got to sing right now you get down there with your family you get down there with your family 
and we're going to pray. Oh, hallelujah. 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 God, we need you in a mighty way. We need you in a mighty way. Oh, hallelujah. I wish you'd lift your hands and just begin to call on the name of Jesus. Call on the name of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Don't you be scared. Don't you be afraid. Don't you be ashamed. Don't you be embarrassed. We need this morning. We need a vacation. We need this morning. We need time off. We need this morning. We need a family day. We need prayer. We need prayer with our families. We need prayer. We need to unite and connect. We need to get together and let God connect us in the Holy Ghost. In this, but come on. Come on. I feel the, I, can you hear that? There's intercessory prayer going on in this altar right now. Pray over your f baby's future. Begin to speak to the future right now. Begin to speak to their plans. Oh, God, we need you. God, we need you. That's it. The Holy Ghost has fallen in this place. The Holy Ghost. There's a revival of families in this place. There's a revival of families in this church. That's it, Lord. Me, go ahead. Let God use you right now. Let God use you right now. In the name of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. If you don't have your Father with you today, I wish you just would lift your hands and let the Heavenly Father, I wish you let the Heavenly Father touch you right now. Oh, God, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Go ahead, let God minister to you. Let God minister to you right now. Oh, we need you, God. We need you, oh Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, God. God, help us.